questions? How was your walk? Sorry? How was your walk? Walk? Did you walk? Oh, oh yeah, just walking down before we all got started about 30 minutes ago. Yeah, just check out. You are walking course. through on the court. I was like, walking? What house do you want me to get here? <laughs> <laughs> I was walking. We were walking through some stuff as a staff on the court. You got a segue? What's that? Segway, yeah, hover more. Well, I got all kinds of stuff now. I, I, I just walk places. Part, too. Of, part of the Jordan deal. Walk or drive, the two things. Yeah. <laughs> um, two weeks away. Are, are you in panic mode that it's that it's this close, or are you feeling you know kind of good about where things are at right now? Certainly not in panic mode. Coaches are always in panic mode two weeks before the season. <laughs> I think the better term to describe what we're doing is just a sense of urgency. You know, I think we have a, a sense of urgency. It, it, we probably always have a sense of urgency. I'd at least like to think that, but it does get a little heightened as you get a little closer. Um, you know, the on the court, there's the things that, the foundational stuff, you know, that your values, like, you know, obviously those are things outside of X and O's, but when you get to the X and O's, there's the foundational values of how we're trying to play offense, the things that we really value there, how we're trying to play defense, the things we value there. And you're trying to refine those things every single day throughout the preseason um, and never lose sight of those things. But as you get closer to games, some of those situational things or some of those bells and whistles that you just have to have to play a game, you, you know, they become – Honestly, every year you go, man, we don't have this in and we don't have that in and we haven't addressed enough out-of-bounds plays or maybe we haven't guarded uh, certain actions we know we'll face early in the year. So the little things start creeping up on you and you do feel that the, the season's getting closer. But we do a really good job of preparing here as a staff. And so even though we're having a little bit of that, I, I think we, we planned well this preseason. And from a structural standpoint, we're pretty far along. Our, our, as far along as we should be to this stage. There's been more of these two-time waivers denied, and obviously more people are appealing, and a lot of people are kind of in the same boat as you. Do you see a dramatic overturning of all this, or, or and any update on how you're handling your guys? You know, I think, uh, as I said in Kansas City last week, um, I, I think like we're at a very interesting inflection point with this second time transfer process. Um, and, and I think the NCAA has a, a real opportunity to get this right. You know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hope and have faith that, uh, that they do. And I, I you know, and, and in the meantime, we're gonna try to do everything we can uh, within laws and rules to help our guys get on the basketball court because they, they should be. They were led to believe they would be if they met guidelines and standards, which they've met, right? And so the process is not over. We're going to trust that this process, I'm, I'm going to have faith that the NCAA is going to use this as an opportunity to do the right thing. And if, if, if it's important to the membership, you know, we all are the NCAA as a membership, to find a way to restrict two-time transfers then, then we should find a way to do that collectively, regardless of what some coach does, or, do, does or doesn't think. But we have to make sure that that process is clear, that it's concise, that it's not arbitrary. And I, I hope that the NCAA doesn't penalize young people for a process that seems very difficult and confusing. Um, again, at 40 years old, if if uh, been through quite a bit as a leader, at least in this field, if, if I have a very, very difficult time understanding this process and I learn something new every day, well, life decisions were made back in the spring based on a very specific set of guidelines. Imagine what it's like for a young person. And my, my biggest concern right now is uh, Aziz and Jamil's mental well being. And that's not a line. To, to try to help them get a, a waiver, okay? Like, they, they, this is very, 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 very difficult. They don't understand. They don't understand why they can't play. <laughs> like, imagine you made a life decision under the belief that you would be able to play basketball because of what you read and what people that were supposed to experts that you consulted with told you, 
that, that if you went through this process based on the things in your life, you're going to be able to play when you transfer. You made life decisions to do that. And then imagine now they can't participate in our scrimmages. Like they haven't even gotten to games yet. And that they are they are confused. And that's this very, very difficult on a on a so many different levels. It's very confusing and difficult for them. And that's my number one concern. And then obviously for our team to get them on the court. Um, because it has an effect in, on so many so many levels. So, I, again, at this point, we're going through the process. Uh, I, I have faith that the NCAA is, is supposed to be about student athletes and student athlete well-being. That, that's what the organization is in place for. I have faith they're going to look at what's been going on here and, and look at this process and realize that it needs to get cleaned up and be a little bit more streamlined or, or maybe communicate the process a little better and let's hope they don't penalize or use young people as examples and I, I, I have faith that, that won't happen i have faith that they'll do the right thing have the appeals been submitted and do you have any better understanding of the timeline now than last time we spoke yeah we've submitted appeals um i i don't i don't have a timeline because they, they don't give you a very specific timeline other than that they uh, they'll, they'll move quickly and you know, we, we hope to hear back. We hope to hear some good news soon so that, you know, number one, Aziz and Jamil can can just settle in and focus on the things that are important for a day-to-day -day college student um, and not all this other junk. And then, and then obviously it helps us prepare with our team. Aziz and Jamil are obviously the big topic right now, but if they were not eligible, how much does it help having ODM Vic back this year? Well, again, I'm, I'm not going to think about them not being eligible because I – I don't think that's fair to them. I, I, it would be an injustice for them not to be eligible, in my opinion. So we're not even going to talk about that. But having Vic and Odie back is extremely valuable to this club. I mean, you know, two guys that had a ton of success the last two years in our program. But even more importantly, they've had success playing on the court together. They've been through things together. So they both improved. They both had the kind of off seasons that that we expect to the standard that we expect here. And um, I, I think they're both poised to have really good years. And uh, the continuity in the program, it does mean so much, you know, that they've done it together. They've been through things together. They know how we do things. I mean, I could go on and on and on about how important continuity is. And you have continuity with the right kind of people. It's really good for the program and really good for this year's team. And we have that with Odie and Vic. You told us a few weeks ago, <laughs> that this team is in a better spot at this point in the year than your past two teams at Cincinnati. Since we talked this a few weeks ago, how much of how much has everyone improved? The young guys, how much have they matured? The older guys growing in leadership, that kind of thing. Yeah, you, you, we're starting to try to become a basketball team, right? And I think the what, what's been important from a coaching perspective is to try to create some real challenge or you know, some real adversity in the preseason. So the first time that we go through something or have to fight through something as a group isn't in a real game. Like you want your preseason to have some moments that really challenge the group and force the group to have to figure out how to overcome those challenges together. So we've, you know, put our foot on the gas a little bit as a coaching staff, certainly in my seat, I've been much more divisive and challenging in our last week and a half of practice. And I think it's the right time to do that. You know, we we have a group that's mature. We have a group that's unselfish and wants to be good. But wanting to do those things is one thing. Figuring out and learning how to do them together is something else. And we've been really, really pushing the gas a little bit here the last week and a half. Our, our tone's been strong with this team. Aziz and Jamil, are they still as active in the program, practice-wise, all that stuff? Just obviously haven't been able to participate in scrimmages, but are they – you feel like they'll be ready to roll, able to get out there and play the normal amount of minutes that they would normally play once they get cleared here? Yes, the, the, the only thing they haven't participated in is um, any competition against another opponent. Um, and you only get two of those in the preseason. We've had one. We'll have another one this weekend. They're, they're the secret thing that they, you know, whatever. You, but I, it, there's, a, there's actually some good to that, right? Like there's a reason why I don't talk about it because – you know, you agree with another coach that you're not going to talk about it. You know, coaches approach them very, very differently. And, you know, I can tell you I approach one differently than the other. It has nothing to do with the opponent. 
So I, to try to analyze based on scores and box scores and stuff, we don't approach it like a game. So it, it'd be silly to have media and, and other people, you know, analyze it like a game because we don't. We're, we're using it as a glorified practice. But anyway, um, those two, those two events, if they're not eligible to compete in games, or they're not eligible to compete in those closed door scrimmages. So outside of those two dates in our preseason, they're cleared to participate in every everything else that we do. So they, yes, they they should be as in good a condition as anybody on our team. You're replacing four of your top five scorers from last year. How do you feel like this team offensively? is stacking up to to deal with that especially the guards and wings that are you know asked to fill dave and and landers and jd's kind of production from last year yeah you know it's the makeup of the team is so much different that the direct comparisons probably are a waste of my time and energy and unfair right um i, I think our style of play with this group is really evolving. I, I wouldn't say totally changing because the foundational things have mattered, but it's really evolving. We're playing significantly faster, right? I mean, significantly faster. We're, we have real depth, like, you know, you hope that continues, but we have real depth. So we're playing significantly faster. We're in the open court in advantage situations more consistently. Um, the ball, we're really emphasizing ball movement with this group and you know, if you thought about our team this time last year, you know, you, you had two guys, like Dave being number one. I mean, some of your best offense in the half court was, like, get Dave the ball where he's comfortable and get the heck out of his way. I mean, he, he was an elite, he was an elite ball screen player, but he was an elite isolation player. I mean, as good as, as, good as we had in college basketball under 6'2 last year. I mean, he, just get him, you know, we don't have – that kind of a guy, and that's not a knock on anybody, but we don't have somebody that has those strengths, so we're trying to generate offense by creating more advantages and more, more ball and player movement, uh, more advantages in the open court. I, we focused a lot more this year on executing offensive sets, and again, Landers Nolly had some elite skills that he could kind of make some things happen with his skill and size when there wasn't a lot there. And, and then obviously Jeremiah was such a threat beyond the three-point line and every team was so worried about that. You know, our makeup of our best offensive players a year ago was different than the makeup of this group of offensive players. So we're approaching it differently. So to compare would, would be a little unfair. And the other thing, it's gonna be a little offensive process, Chad, with this team, because quite frankly, we'd had Dave for a year and some change. So we kind of knew, like, where, where do you make sure Dave has the ball? Like, and where is his role? You knew that going into the year, so we could work on that from day one. You know, we, we, we had Jeremiah for a year, so we kind of knew exactly the right places that we thought he should be used. We're still kind of figuring that out with this group. And certainly you, you learn a lot more when you play against somebody else in, than, than when you play against yourselves in practice. So we're learning a lot against ourselves, but shoot, we jumped up and scrimmaged somebody else, and you go, oh, well, that, a little different against a different style of defense um, or a, a different style of defense that isn't the scout team, right? So it's going to be a little bit of a process, but I think there's some trends with this team that will be much different than the last. And that doesn't say anything good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, we were really explosive at times last year, so I, I, I was proud of who we became as an offensive team. You mentioned that fans are really going to like Jizzle James, but you, you've compared him to Dave on occasion a little bit. I know it's not Dave yet, but I mean – his work ethic and things like that. I was, I was like, how did I compare him to Dave? I was trying to remember that. Uh, yeah, just coming in and, you know, coming early, staying late, it, that if, type thing. Listen, you guys say that I'm comparing a freshman to David Joy. Dave Joy's going to FaceTime me before I leave this press conference asking me I can't compare any freshman to him. But, um, no, his – Dave, to me, is the standard for how you approach the work you do outside of practice – in this program. He set the standard for what that looks like, the, what you do when you're not practicing. Um, and I, I, I can't, can't give Jizzle the credit that he's at that level, but for somebody his age, he's impressed me with his approach on the things he's doing, not just when practice is going on. 
Um, and that bodes well for him to have a good year. He's a freshman. I mean, I, he's a freshman that's playing point guard. So he's had some bad days, guys. I mean, I, it's just no way around that. And I've, I've actually been pleased that we've gone through some difficult days on the court with him because you know it's going to happen, so let's deal with it now. But I think that it's been challenging, you know, for him at times to try to learn a new system that's at a new level. And we're also playing extremely fast and we're pressuring the basketball. And there's a, there's a lot for him right now. But because of his mindset, if he continues to have the same mindset, he's going to be fine and he's going to have a good good freshman year. The, the Davion Thomas, you know, they talk about Jizzle a lot because, you know, deservingly so. But Davion Thomas has been really solid thus far at point guard. I, I think any of our the players would say that. And, I think our coaching staff would say that, that he might not have had the biggest name in recruiting coming from junior college, but he's been pretty dang good so far. But he's going to have some adjustment as well. And we're trying to make sure they go through, go through some of that now, not just when games start. You mentioned the depth of this team. How has that competition day in and day out in practice helped with the growth throughout this offseason? You know, like, I, I just believe in what you just said. I mean, believe when you know the talk about player development we care a lot about that here you talk about team development and when you're around a bunch of other people that have the same goals and um, mindset that you do and they have talent and you know they want to be great and you put all that into the same environment every day you know like rising tides float all boats type of thing I mean I think I think that's the idea of it let's get it trying to build a great culture I think we're taking a lot of steps there. We're trying to get the right people to fit into that. Fit into that, and we hope that all of us help elevate each other. And that's the idea. That's where real growth happens. Iron sharpens iron. Some might say. Iron sharpens iron. You referencing my buddy. The the Big Twelve director of officiating spoke at media day, saying that there's going to be some changes to the charge and block rule, and that they looked at 100 charges, and I think 96 of them would now be blocks. Um, I would just wanted your thoughts on that. If you like that change or if it will be a significant adjustment that you guys have? Yeah, so we had our commissioner of officials, I think he's been going around uh, everywhere in the league, came, came by here and uh, showed us some film of, of that rule change specifically. Talked about all the rule changes, but showed us some film of that. And, you know, we've been hearing about it, I've read about it, but, you know, list, listening, to, listening to Curtis talk about it was impactful. And it was really impactful for him to talk to our team. So, yeah, it's, it, I, it's going to be a different game this year. Um, you're you're going to have a really hard time drawing charges. And that's just what it is. I, uh, I, th I think you're going to have to be set. It's almost like you're going to have to be a statue before somebody even thinks about going into their shooting motion. <laughs> and that's not the actual rule, but I, I think that's the best way to understand it. I mean, it's going to be really hard to draw a charge. So you got to adjust some of your teaching and some of your habits, and we've been doing that. Um, and then I think we try to do a nice job of emphasizing that in practice and live play. Did anyone have more fun last week than Victor Locken? And have you <laughs> seen uh, – describe how you've seen him blossom since you've been here. Scott, if you can ask a question to make me laugh out loud in a press conference, you did good today. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, yeah, he had a, it wasn't just Vic. I think Vic and Odie – um, who else did we take with John us? Goff. And John Newman, my gosh, senior moment. But Vic and Odie and John Newman, they had a blast last week. It, and, it, and I think, you know, first off, it reminds you as a coach, we're still around young people every day, and that's fun. that was fun for me to watch them have fun. You know, it makes me feel young. But the, the other thing is it's a credit to the job the Big 12 does. I mean, it was first class. It was first class, and, and they did a great job with our guys and the, the letting the players have a really neat experience. So that that was really cool. Um, but as fun as you guys saw them having at media day, we got on the plane to fly back to practice. We had to get back for practice that night. And Victor and was sitting right across from me, and he told me he was going to try to distract me the whole flight so that I couldn't write practice. <laughs> and he was so dang tired from all the fun you saw him having. It, that distraction lasted about three and a half minutes, and I got a great practice written. So he, as, as fun as he was having, he was tired as could be when he got on that airplane. Chad, last one. 
you mentioned pressure a minute ago. You, you haven't really been able to press the way that you wanted to your first two years here. Do you think this team is, is more suited to that? And will we see maybe a little bit more of that this year? Yeah, we, we've, we've, we've certainly played with it a little bit. I thought last year, you know, when I was evaluating the year at the end of the season, I thought we spent a little too much time on it early and we had when John's injury occurred, that we probably weren't ready to press like that. And we'd spent quite a bit of time in, in our preseason. Now, like hindsight's twenty twenty, and if John would have been healthy, I think that team could have pressed a lot more. Um, so I do think we'll evolve to that. We have we have some stuff in, and we've worked at it a little bit, but we haven't spent as much time on it yet, just because I don't want to make the same error that I, that we might went, might have made a year ago. Um, but the things that we do defensively, the things like our defensive principles and our full and half court man to man. If you really invest in those, it's actually pretty easy to start pressing because a lot of the same principles and habits apply, even though some of the structure changes. All right, thanks, Coach. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks, Coach.